Hi folks, Mr. Ackman here. Thanks for watching. The topic of this video is Lessons 3 and 4 in Unit 4. We are going to be dealing with gravitational potential energy near the Earth's surface, the changes that occur in that energy when we raise or lower an object, and also kinetic energy, which you're familiar with, and the law of conservation of energy. So the good news here is that this is actually really just a review of grade 11 ideas. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. In G class, you're going to find both lessons and the associated YouTube videos, the instructional videos, and you can complete those pretty much together because they do go together and you learn them together when you took grade 11. And if you jump into the unit schedule, you'll see some suggested practice problems that we would normally do in class, as well as the ones you should try after. And make sure, of course, you're checking your solutions against the solution manual. Let's jump quickly into the lecture notes for Lesson 3, Gravitational Potential Energy. So here we're talking about gravitational potential energy when an object moves up or down in a constant gravitational field. Now if you think back to g equals big G mass of Earth over the radius of Earth squared, that's what gives you 9.8. As long as we don't raise something so high that the value of little g changes, we have what's called a constant gravitational field. And in that case, the work we do is given by the formula mg delta h. And all of that is explained in the instructional video. You might be wondering what happens if we raise something so high that g, little g, actually changes. For example, if we launch a rocket ship and the, the, the payload of the rocket ship is going so high that little g becomes less and less. We're going to talk about that in chapter 6. So don't worry about it for now. Right now we're staying near the Earth's surface. Anyway, the derivation of the formula is uh, shown in the first slide of that lecture note. And then there's a few uh, graphics here which go over what you'll remember as the reference point. So let's just talk about this briefly. If I am, let's think back to Thorn Lee. If I'm on the first floor of Thorn Lee and I raise a one kilogram object by one meter, I do a certain amount of work, which is given by mg delta h. Now let's say I do the same lifting on the second floor. How much work do I do? Is it the same or different? Well, strictly speaking, it's not the same. We're a little bit higher up, farther from the Earth's center, and therefore we could say that the value of little g is a tiny bit less, so I do a little bit less work. But for all practical purposes, I'm doing the same amount of work because little g doesn't change much between first floor and the second floor of Phil and Lee. So what we do when we're staying near the Earth's surface is we set a reference point where EG, the gravitational potential energy, will be zero, and we measure positive changes in EG going above that and negative changes when we go below. And in terms of going below, you could imagine dropping something down into a hole as an example. We're going to lose gravitational potential energy. There'll be a negative delta EG. And if you're wondering where does that energy go because of the law of conservation of energy, the answer in the case of dropping something is it would show up in the kinetic energy that the object would gain as it fell. There'd also be air resistance, so there would be thermal energy produced, but we'll get into all that stuff later. Anyway, remember you want to set a level of EG0, a height of zero, a reference point at some point in your problem and keep it constant as you solve the problem. A practice problem for you to work on in the lecture notes is number four on page 191, and you can check your solutions when you, uh, when you get that one done. And that's really about it. It's a very straightforward lesson. It's going to look a lot like grade 11, so hopefully it's not going to present too much of a problem to you. What I'd like to do right now is jump into lesson four, where things get a little bit more interesting. We start off with the classic problem of a pendulum swinging, and we're asking in question 7 on 197, if the pendulum is starting off at this point here, you've seen it raised off to the side, then how fast is it going to be going when it reaches its maximum speed? And the idea here, of course, is that the object moves down along its path, it loses EG, it gains EK, we are neglecting air resistance, so it's a simple EG to EK conversion. The law of conservation of energy tells us that energy can't be created or destroyed. It can only change form. So if we know the total amount at one point in the problem, then we can take that amount 
and keep it constant throughout the problem and use it to solve for the various different kinds of energy as we move. Uh, if you want to take a look in YouTube, there's a great demonstration of a physics professor, I forget what university, but he takes a bob with a fairly heavy mass, he's in the lecture hall, and he leans up against the wall, he pulls it back, and he lets go, and it swings all the way to the other side of the lecture hall and comes back. Sure enough, it comes just in front of his face and stops, showing that the energy is conserved. Uh, I believe his last name is Lewin, L-E-W-Y-N, something like that. And if you type in Pendulum of Conservation of Energy, I'm sure it'll come up. It's a lot of fun. The students in the class really seem to enjoy it, and I'm sure you will too. Let's move on to the next practice problem. Here we've got someone pushing an object against the floor, and this time there is friction. So this time you're going to see thermal energy come in to the problem. And I'm not going to go into this too much here, because I believe I cover this problem or something similar in the instructional video. But the idea here is that the friction force acts through a distance, and it acts and in a direction relative to the motion. So if I'm pushing an object forward, and this is my delta D, but there's a friction force acting backward, and this is the FF, then the angle between these two vectors, theta, is 180 degrees. And of course, the cos of theta, when you have 180 degrees, is going to be negative 1. So when I do FF cos theta delta D, that's going to be the work. What work is it? It's the work done by friction. And we often call this E thermal. So it's kind of like if you rub your hands together and they start to get warm, you're experiencing the same kind of creation of energy. Of course, it's coming from somewhere else. Where is it coming from? Well, it's coming from the clerk in the problem who's pushing the mass with a certain force through a distance. And then where does that energy go? Some of it becomes thermal energy, but some of it also uh, speeds up the object. Now, I believe in this question it starts from rest and it become, begins moving. So you're going to get a little bit of EK, but not as much EK as if there were no thermal energy. So give this one a try. Use the work energy theorem and see what answer you get. Check your solutions in the solution manual and make sure you're doing this one correctly. I think you'll be able to handle it. It's not too hard, but in case you have trouble, the solutions are there. Last question, and this is what we're going to wrap up with, is question 6 on 201. I'd like to show you how to do this using the law of conservation of energy in the form of the work energy theorem, because there is another way you can do it. I want you to try it this way, and then I want you to compare that with the book solution. So we're checking the solution manuals. They do it a little bit differently, okay? I want to show you this way, which is not the way the book does it, so that you see that the work energy theorem and the way the book does it are really the same thing. So I'm going to just pull myself off to the side here so I have the whole screen. This question talks about a skier who is at the top of a hill and is going to head down the hill, and the angle of inclination is given by the Greek letter phi. That's phi, in case you're wondering. They don't use theta this time. Anyway, we start at the top. The displacement is going to be 11.7 meters, and at the very top, the skier, I'll do my best artistic impression of a skier. There we go. His mass is given is moving at a very slow speed, just uh, about 65.7. So we have, this is in centimeters per second, make sure you convert that to meters. And by the time the skier gets to the bottom, it's moving faster, as you might expect, and that number is given here. So there's definitely been a delta EK. There's a half and the final squared minus a half the initial squared. Okay? Now, they also tell you that there's a friction force of 41.5 newtons. So let's look at this for a sec. I'm just going to change colors so things are easier to see. We've got the normal force, 
we've got a friction force, and of course we have gravity. And if we use the idea that the total work done is some contribution of all the different forces, then we can just say, well, what's the normal force doing? Well, the normal force is at 90 degrees to the displacement, so it does nothing. Now, the friction force is acting against the displacement, so we could say the work done by friction comes from FF cos 180 delta D, and that's going to give us a negative number. And we've also got the work done by gravity, which is a force. Now, let's look at this for a moment. Here's a 90 degree angle, which means this is 90 minus 5. And if we draw the horizontal in there, then we've got this angle here, phi as well. So let's see if that can help you figure out what component of gravity is acting on the steer. I'm just going to draw it in that, and then I'm going to give you a little bit of a thicker vector. So there is FGY, which if you remember is MG cos phi. And then this one here is FGX, and that is MG sine phi. So this is the angle which is propelling, if you will, the skier down the hill. And because we've resolved it into components, we can say something like this, FGX. Now, be careful here, cos theta, theta is the angle dw between delta d and the force. Because I'm going to talk about this, the component, it's actually parallel to the displacement. So my angle is going to be zero degrees. Okay. Now you might be wondering, what about the angle of the hill? But that's already included in the sine phi here. So this is going to give me, let's just go through this, FF is 41.5, cos 180 is minus 1, and the delta D is 11.7. FGX is going to be 55 kilograms times G, 9.8, times, now the sine of phi, cos theta is going to be cos zero degrees. So this was the force here, written as a component. That's the cos theta in the work formula. And the delta D is 11.7. So I'm not going to go any further with this. Let me just bring myself back in here. I'm not going to go any further with this. What I want you to do is to work this out and see that you actually get to the same answer as you would have if you did it the way the book does it. The book's going to do it using L-O-C-O-E, Law of Conservation of Energy, probably the way you're familiar. This looks like a different way, but you're going to see you get to the same answer, and so it's actually the same thing. The reason I show you this is because every year in class, students say to me, hey, wait a minute. The friction force is acting at 180 degrees to the displacement, but when I look in the textbook, they don't have that. Why is that, Mr. Ackerman? And then I have to explain to them, well, it's because of this. Your textbook kind of takes a shortcut without saying anything, and if you want to do this question the way the unit has been teaching you to solve these problems, then you need to see this solution. Anyway. That's all for now. I hope it works out for you. If you have problems, message me and I'll do my best to get back to you. Hope to see you guys soon. Hope you're doing well. Stay safe. Bye for now.